please stand. Stand up for Jesus. 411, please. 411 in your red hymnals. Now, where's the light for this one? 411 in your red hymnals. Wake up, church. Yeah, man. Good morning to you. 411. Let's begin. Conquering now and still to conquer, rideth the King in his might, leading the host of all the faithful into the midst of the fight. See them with courage advancing, clad in their brilliant array, shouting the name of their leader, Hear them exultingly say, Not to the strong is the battle, Not to the swift is the race, Yet to the true and the faithful, Victory is promised through, Yes! Conquering now and still to conquer, Who is this wonder? Woo! Whence are the armies which he leadeth, while of his glory they sing. He is our Lord and Redeemer, Savior and Monarch divine. They are the stars have forever, bright in his kingdom will shine. Not to the strong is the battle, not to the swift is the race. Yet to the true and the faithful, victory is promised through grace. Conquering now and still to conquer, Jesus our ruler of all. Thrones and their scepters all shall perish, Crowns in their splendor shall fall. Yet shall the armies thou lead us, faithful and true to the last. Find in thy mansions eternal, rest when their warfare is past. Not to the strong is the battle, not to the swift is the race. Yet to the true and the faithful, victory is promised through grace. Amen. All right, a really good song that we all know. We're going to sing 271, please. In your red hymn books, 271. It's good to know. As the preacher said before, good to know that my sins are forgiven, that I'm saved, because my anchor holds. Though the angry surges roll on my tempest driven soul, I am peaceful for I know. Wildly though the winds may blow, I've an anchor safe and sure that can never more endure. And it holds my anchor whole, though your wildest head don't care. On oh, my bark so small and frail. By his grace I shall not fail, for my head her hold, my head her hold. Mighty tides about me sweep, perils lurk within the deep. Angry clouds or shade the sky, and the tempest rises high. Still I stand, the tempest shock, for my anchor grips on rock, and it holds my anchor whole. Blow your wild this and okay, on my bar so small and frail. 
by his grace I shall not fail for my hair Last verse, troubles all, most whelm the soul, griefs like billows o'er me roll, tempter seek to lure astray, storms obscure the light of day, but in cry I can be bold, I've an anchor that shall hold, and it holds my anchor whole. Lo, your wife, this hand hold hell. On my bark, so small and frail. By his grace, I shall not fail. For my anchor hold. Let's start off the service with the word of prayer. I'm going to give a prayer for our preachers. Let's pray. God, my Father, I pray that you'll please fill within our preachers with the power of your Holy Spirit, the cleansing of your blood. I know that it can be a lot of pressure when preaching your sacred word to hungry sheep. So I pray that you'll please put a spirit of peace upon our preachers. I pray that we will all worship thee as the book of John chapter 4 says, in spirit and in truth, Amen. all spirits will be united as one, supportive of one another, and that we stand for Bible-believing truth to glorify your name. This is not a charismatic church service or a neo-evangelical church service or a Catholic funeral. This is a Bible-believing worship service which should glorify you more than anything else. So will you please put a special blessing upon this service and on our preachers and make us be receptive to what you want to speak to us and not thinking that it's man speaking, but that you want us to get something out of this message through imperfect vessels. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you please be seated? It can be a lot of pressure for these preachers, especially when you have the big speakers speaking. So will you please be supported? Pastor Randy Gorski. Thank you so much, brother, for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Put that on your tie. <laughs> Where's this going again? Your tie. It's okay. 55 is okay, all right? Okay. Hey, man, first of all, I just want to say thank you uh, to Pastor Gene Kim. He's been a huge blessing to me for really the extent of my ministry. Um, little bit of background because I know I'm just some new kid on the block and I realize exactly who I am. I'm Pastor Nobody from Nowhere, California and amen. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> but um, I do believe I have a message from the Lord for you folks. Um, this church and obviously Gene's dad's church um, has always been a big support to me so um, they're like my Asian family you know. <laughs> And I realize that, that my only inlet is that I married an Asian, and I get that. Um, and Gene actually reminded me, he said, you know, you, actually, your child is even more qualified than you, Randy, <laughs> because he's half Asian, and I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, and since I brought up the topic of race, why stop now? <laughs> Josh, you know what I'm talking about. They segregated us brother <laughs> why is it that both the polish preachers get the same day in the same spot <laughs> what's so funny <laughs> is it really because it takes two of us to do any one thing <laughs> all right all right, please uh, get, get your Bibles. Open up to uh, 2 Kings chapter 13. <clears throat> Let's open in a word of prayer.
God, I pray for this service. Lord, I pray that you'd move me out of your way. You get behind a pulpit like this, you really feel the power. We don't want to, uh, I don't want to get in your way. So I just pray, God, you give me the freedom and liberty amen. to preach. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. <clears throat> Sometimes you, in order to know where you're going, you got to look at where you came. Uh, look at verse 14. Um, <clears throat> it says this, 2 Kings 13, 14. It says, Now Elijah was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. And Joash the king of Israel came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. <clears throat> I'm going to bring to you a message today, and maybe there's better titles for it. I, I don't major on anything. Actually, I don't even know why you invited me to preach, but hey, I'm just going to give it a shot, you know? And I'm going to title this thing, Faith of Our Falters. Faith of Our Falters. So my first point we're going to look at is this father of the faith. And... We have a great thing as Bible believers. We have a King James Bible. Amen? Amen? So just by that alone, if somebody comes to your church, preacher, they're going to be miles ahead. Amen? Yeah. We get that. Just by, I mean, even if you don't preach good, amen. Uh, even if God doesn't show up miraculously in the service and get everyone slain in the spirit and, you know, and Brother Hilton's like, really, huh? Slain in the spirit? <laughs> Southern California. <laughs> but but <laughs> what do we find? We find fathers fallen and sick. And you stick around long enough, you're going to start seeing your brethren falling. And I, I feign to say that there be folks in this room, you're not going to end well. Now, I'm not trying to blast you. I'm just, that's just factual, right? I, I hope it's not you. But it's probably going to be somebody. Hopefully it ain't me. I hope you're praying for each other. But what do we find then? We find uh, father's dead and gone. He says, my father, my father. And um, let's just park the car right there. Amen. <laughs> Some great fathers of the faith invested a lot in you. You. Not your neighbor. You. Maybe not even all of them were Baptists. Somebody invested in you. Somebody took their time out for you. You never forget those folks, amen? You know, I, I thought it was interesting. Uh, he quotes Elijah's words when Elijah was taken up in Second uh, Kings 2.12. You want to look over there? So you know I'm not a liar. <clears throat> After Elijah in verse 11, 2 Kings 2, 11, taken up in the whirlwind into heaven, says in verse 12, And Elijah saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. Now, Joash, whatever you want to say about him, my message is not about him. My message is about you. <laughs> Why preach against his sins? Let's preach against yours. Amen. Amen. Um, <clears throat> I I personally have had some folks invest in me, Amen. and not all of them are Baptists, Amen. and they took time for me. I wasn't raised in a Baptist church. 
And for those of you that know where I came from, uh, sorry. <laughs> you know, sorry you know where I came from. Uh, but, it, but my dad is here, and there's nothing you can't tell him that he doesn't already know, okay? So, <laughs> that's right. But I want to talk about, just for a moment, a man that invested in me. And his name's Pastor Audie Yancey. He was a Baptist, so get comfortable, okay? <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> this man, uh, me and my wife, uh, there, there, uh, it's kind of a story, but there was a pastor that in, showed me and my dad, and man, it must have been 1997, sat down with us for hours and hours, and probably longer than we wanted to talk, about the King James Bible. This guy at, at that church at that time, he was considered to be a psychotic Amen. <laughs> yeah. Because of his position on the Bible. So, uh, so anyway, um, me, at that point, uh, I started doing drugs too young. There is not a good age to do that, but uh, I was on drugs, and I wasn't even saved sitting at the table with my dad and him talking about the Bible. I'm like, I was just kind of sitting back like, this guy is really pumped up about this book. <laughs> And, uh, and anyway, my dad jokes about it. He says, you had a drug problem. I drug you to church, you know. <laughs> and so I would go to church, and, um, and I would watch this guy get nose to nose with the, the associate pastor over what? This book. Yeah. And I'm like, he's really uh, motivated, you know. <laughs> and I didn't really get it. But you know what? I just stored it in the back. And... Once uh, my life was getting serious and I needed to figure out what I was going to do with the Lord, I was like, there was a brother. <laughs> and I got in touch with him. That guy ended up doing me and my wife's wedding. And we were going to his little house church. He didn't even run 10 people. And um, uh, he said, brother, there's a church closer to you. I'm like, yeah. He's like, I think you should go. It's more, you know, he's like, I'm a local church pastor. I think you should go because it's more your locality. And it was the pastor that sent him out to Roseman. It was Pastor Adi Yancey. So I went there and I didn't know him, just some old guy, you know. <laughs> Dentures fall out sometimes when he's preaching. <laughs> hey, man. You'd have a good time in church, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and anyway, he, um, right about that time, he made a, a gospel track. This man's an old man. He's sitting there like cutting out paper like newspaper and he puts it with scotch tape and he <laughs> runs it through his little photo stat, uh, whatever it was, you know. It's all hand done. He makes these little tracks about like this. They're full. It has a flag on it. In the name of Allah, they brought death and destruction. It's about 9-11. You open it in the name of Jesus, you can have eternal life. Could there be anything more simple? This man was brought up on a hate crime. This man was brought up on a straight up hate crime. Because the Muslim chaplain from our area, um, it was actually his boy, picked up one and said, Dad, Dad, look. And uh, they wanted to bring up my pastor on a hate crime. And I guess they couldn't find a real court to do it, so they make some mock trial thing with... Uh, with, uh, man, I don't even know how to say this, but we, we got there not realizing who this thing was, and lo and behold, one of our elders was on this board. Now, I don't credit it to him. I, maybe he was affiliated with the group before it ever happened. But uh, what was happening in the church during that time, young pastor, think about this, is people were leaving our church because they were afraid for their lives because he was getting bad publicity from the Islamic community in our city. And our folks at church were leaving because they thought we were going to get firebombed. Now, now I, I, uh, I was interested, you know? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I was kind of bad in the world. And, you know, I'm like, all right, you know? <laughs> All right, he's not afraid to tango. Yeah. Amen. 
And anyway, uh, the, there was a church from a fallen pastor now that actually lost his family. And I'm not saying, oh, thank God for that. That's a shame. But that guy, he blamed my pastor for his church disbanding when he wasn't even charging him rent to use a small building. And we were paying him for some land that he never even used in Tehachapi. Oh, there's some guys here that might know who I'm talking about. And my pastor, my pastor, he stood about right here with tears in his eyes. And he said, now this is a fully decorated Marine, right. gunny sergeant. Right. He said, I laid down my life for this country and I'm not about to stop. Amen. <laughs> And I was, I, I leaned over to my wife, and I said, let's get out of here. No, I'm just, no I, I said, I said, I think we found our church. Now, I don't know what this is all about, but maybe, maybe this is for you, maybe it's not. But I've never seen a pastor stand up like that when it costs something. Uh, hold your finger there in 2 Kings and go to Hebrews 12. I never seen a pastor stand up like that when it counted. Now that, now that guy was brought up on a hate crime and he didn't just show up. He didn't just show up with his tail between his legs. He showed up in his dress blues. <laughs> carrying a Koran. <laughs> Amen. Paul Chapel didn't show up. I thought he would have. I, I honestly, I thought he would have. I worked with folks from that church, and I begged them, please tell Paul Chapel. Please tell. We need any support. Amen. Any support. I know personally three men that contacted him that the, the day of the trial. I know, I know he knew. And just for what it's worth, so you save your money. CLA refused to represent him. Yeah. Save your money. Yeah. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. <clears throat> Joash uh, must have known Elijah's history, quoted exactly what he said. But you know what? There were some great fathers of the faith that you had. I, I could sit here, I could fill up the whole service with, with stories of Pastor Yancey. I could do it, very simply. But that's not the message I want to bring to you. That's just one man. You, you probably have your men as well. You can list off a few that stood for this stuff. Amen? Well, I got, I got one more then about him. As we start going there, the elders raised up and raised up. And what? They wanted him out. And they tried to get rid of Pastor Yancey. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> and one of them, the day of the little explosion, had a heart attack that day. I stored that in the back of my head. I've only heard of stuff like that. I've never seen that with my own two eyes. You know what God started showing me? He had his hand on him. That's like some Old Testament stuff, man. You don't see that. They raise up. They're like, we're going to get him out. Heart attack. Oh, well, I'm sure it was something else, right? On the very day. Mm-hmm. And uh, then the deacons. I was a deacon. I had to resign from being deacon. And I don't know what's flying around about me, but I've had to make the choice long ago that I don't care. He was my pastor. Amen. Amen. And we're going to save that for the end. 
But there's what we find in our text here in 2 Kings 13 is there's a father of the faith. You need a father in the faith, don't you? Yeah. And one blessing that I've had even just the first night is seeing a couple fathers in the faith yeah. preach it like it's their last sermon they're going to preach. Yeah. I don't know about you, man. Where I came from, you know, you start seeing guys like start kicking things and I get pumped up. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, we were talking about last night. I'm, I'm already gauging the chairs. You don't want to jump off the plastic ones. You know, we want to go metal. OK, you're going metal if you're if you're going to. And you have to do a downward step, not not a. You're going to slip if you go for an downward, okay? And that way you won't fall, okay? <sighs> but you know what? What do we find? We're back in our text, 2 Kings uh, 13. Look at verse 15. It says, And Elijah said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said unto the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And... He put his hand upon it. And Elijah put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elijah said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of the deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till, they have, till thou have consumed them. What do I find? I find ready, aim, fire. Ready, aim, fire. And you know what? There's been some men that pulled out a bow and some arrows. They said, hey, take this bow. Take these arrows. Let me show you how to use that thing. Now, a bow and arrow isn't to comb anyone's hair. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's called deep exegesis right there. <laughs> A bow and arrow is not a teddy bear. A bow and arrow is an instrument of warfare. You know where you aim with a bow and arrow? The heart. That's where you shoot to kill. You don't shoot to wound. You shoot to kill. And you, my friend, you need to be ready. Because it says, uh, take bow and arrows, and he took. It didn't say he argued with him. Hey man, like, what's that going to do? Who am I? It just says, and he took unto him bow and arrows. You got to be ready to follow. Amen. You know, and some of these uh, fathers of the faith, and I'm not deifying anybody, but they're going to help you learn how to follow. Yeah. They had to do it. Amen. Amen. They had to do it. They're not asking you to do anything they haven't done. You got to learn how to follow. You got to be ready to follow. You got to be ready to fight. You know, a lot of times people are just not ready to fight. I, you know, I, I think if, if a situation when it came up to any other pastor in the Antelope Valley, and I preach against them a lot because that's my locality, I know a lot of them, okay? They probably don't know about me, but oh well, who cares? But I've been to their churches and I see how they do, do, do things. And I would venture <laughs> to say if that same situation would have came across them, they would have just bent over. Amen. And he didn't. Why? Because he was showing me. Here's the arrows, Randy. Here's the bow. Pull it back. And shoot. Why is following God always like in a warfare? Why? It's going to take some battle. It's, you know, you run 100 people in your church, maybe the battle gets bigger. I don't know. I've never been there. Maybe you have five people in their church. It's a different warfare, isn't it? Maybe no one in your church. Maybe you don't even have a church. You know, you know what? This ministry reaches to a lot of people that don't even have churches. I got a brother in uh, South Dakota. He took our little Bible Institute, little uh, correspondence Bible Institute. He found out about us through Gene Kim. 
And he said, well, I'm, a, I'm about uh, 40 miles from the edge of the world. <laughs> he said, literally, there, there's nothing. He, he has to drive, I think, 80 miles to the next church, but the, the preacher there was a fruitcake, so uh, he, he um, didn't want to expose his daughter to Amen. some effeminate man. Amen. How about that, preacher? So you got to be ready to follow, ready to fight, because it's like in a warfare. But then we're going to aim in verse 16, 2 Kings 13, 16. Notice it says, Elijah put his hands upon the king's hands. You know, and those fathers of the faith, they helped you, didn't they? Learn how to aim. You know what? Every battle is not your battle. Amen? God needs to show you where your battle is. And uh, me, as, as a young pastor, you know, I've, I, uh, God had to show me that not every battle is my battle. I got enough on my plate with, what, 12 people coming to our church. I could barely handle that. I couldn't imagine 100, 200 people coming. I, I don't know how you guys do it. Um, I'm losing hair, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and my, my dad's like, it's about time. You know, I, I pick on him. I, this is sowing and reaping right here. You know, and I've cracked jokes, and now I'm going bald. You know? You should store that in the back of your mind, all right? You know? Galatians 6, 7 kicks in right there. <clears throat> but those men helped you learn how to aim. And then came time to fire. Now, the best defense is a good offense. That's the best defense. And this is the problem with you pastors, and I'm not excluding myself. You've gotten too comfortable. That's good preacher. Come on. You need to get back in the fight. You need to fight something. You know, Pastor Yancey was good at finding a fight, he just was. He just was. Even after his deacons chased him out, he moved to the other side of the country. I just talked a couple weeks ago with his soul winning buddy. He said, man, Pastor Yancey was kind of rough, wasn't he? And I'm like, man, this, this was probably like weeks before he died. <laughs> but you know what? The best defense is a good offense. And you know... Uh, with this weapon you have, you need to know your offensive weapon. Yes, sir. You need to know it. You need to know it. And you're the only one that can know it for you. I can't know it for you. Right. You know, and as a heart as a minister, my heart would be to help you, or folks at our church, to know that Bible better. To know right doctrine, rightly dividing, on and on and on. But only you can take that time personally. But I want to facilitate a place for you to do that, you know. Um, I want to, I want to, I want to bring. Like most of our church came to this thing. Here they are, Amen. and this is a bless. We've never done anything like this together, so this is this is new for us. But I want to facil I want to bring them around, folks, that'll facilitate that same vision. Amen. To know your offensive weapon, Amen. to clean your offensive weapon. I've never been in the military, but so I've heard they can break that thing down and put it back together with their eyes closed. But you know what? All that's good and great. But you need to use your offensive weapon. You need to shoot something. Amen. You need to shoot something. And some of you, it's been so long since you pulled that arrow back and you're like, I don't know what it is. I, is it the money? I mean, I don't really think there's too much money in our whatever. <laughs> I sure haven't found it. But, <laughs> but I mean, oh, is someone going to leave your church literally if you just preach what's in the book? Maybe they need to leave. Uh <clears throat> I, uh, I can't remember who, who we brought, if it was uh, Dave Yoakum, the chick. I don't think it was that day. It was, um, 
I can't remember who we brought. We brought in SoCal, we live close to Chick Publications, so one thing when missionaries come through, we try to go over there and check it out. It's a blessing. I went in there, and there was a young boy that came in, and I guess he had a scheduled appointment with David Daniels. I'm like, okay. So I'm just kind of like looking around the racks. I'm eavesdropping. I'm nosy. <laughs> and I'm just kind of looking around the racks, and I finally I find myself just like looking at them. <laughs> and... And then, anyway, this kid, this kid, okay, listen to what this kid does. This kid is in the midst of making a King James defense book. Now, press pause. That work's been done. Press pause, you know. I mean, there's, there is a, there's many definitive works on that subject. Press pause. No, but he made his book. His grandma's not going to read anything from Ruckman. His grandma's not going to read anything from you. His grandma's going to read his book. And I venture to say that maybe God put something in your heart, and you're like, man, so many people have done this better. You haven't. You haven't even tried. Um, I came from a great Bible institute, the Bible Doctrine Institute with David Peacock. He's one of those men that handed me some, a bow and some arrows and he showed me how to pull it back and he showed me how to shoot. And if I say anything wrong here, I'm not blaming it on him, okay? <laughs> but <clears throat> we were having a little Bible Institute at our, at our uh, church and... I don't know what it was, just a young boy came up to me and he said, brother, maybe we should record these. I'm like, okay. For, for what? He's like, I don't know, but let's just record them, then we could do whatever. Then doors start opening. We've graduated a guy from Northern Ireland, which is not the Catholic side, amen? <laughs> he reminded me of that, okay? And, uh, and, and then th uh, the guy from South Dakota just finished. Uh, we had a guy from Anaheim, do it with two autistic daughters. He might be watching right now. They don't have a church. And there, there is churches close to him, but he's got two autistic daughters, man. They just tear up the service. And I mean, I'm not saying that any pastor would put, them, put the heat on them for that. That wouldn't be right, I don't believe. But it's just very uncomfortable for him. So he took our Bible Institute, and we... we uh, had a guy finish from Hong Kong. And uh, I'm nobody. I get it. But I got to help those guys. You know, if, if I would have just parked the car and said, you know, I, all this stuff's already been done, those guys probably would have never got the help. And I'm not even saying it's the best, but it's something. God used it. You know, uh, bring your little, he'll make a whole bunch. But you need to learn how to shoot something. Why? Because it's open season. <laughs> you got to shoot something. That's good. Just shoot something, man. That's good. That's good. Okay. okay, you don't know anything. You don't care about anything but the King James Bible. Shoot! <laughs> Amen! That's a lot! You're miles ahead of other folks just knowing that. Uh, the Sodomite agenda. Shoot! <laughs> That boy took his time to shoot. Just a boy. I was thinking about this too. David Daniels took his time to put a bow in his hand. Some arrows. Teach him how to aim. Oh, I'm not doctrinal. I'm the same with him. Oh, hey. All I'm saying is he took the time. Why aren't you? There's probably some young men in this room that are looking up to you. Why aren't you taking your time with them? Are you sick? You're not dead. I'm looking at you. You're still here. Are you sick? They came here for some reason. You just look around. I, oh, well, this is not many people. For one of our meetings, it is. Especially in California. We're not even in the Pacific Ocean yet. They were afraid to come here. Elijah took time with Joash to teach him. How will the younger ever know what you know 
if you refuse to talk to him. Getting a little warmer there. Almost there. Almost there. Now, switching gears, we've been talking about the teacher. Now I want to talk to the student. So we looked at the father of the faith, the following in the faith. Now I want to look at fighting for the faith. You, student, you've been vested in. Men have uh, spent their blood, sweat, and tears teaching you, showing you, rearing you. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? It's your turn. Oh, I'm not a pastor. It's your turn. That little boy wasn't a pastor. Little boy. Maybe it must have been 10, 11 years old. Just a young boy. There's probably no new information in that book. But he made a book. He got one more book out on the subject. Fighting for the faith. In 2 Kings 13, 18, it said, uh, And he said, Take the arrows, and he took them, and he said unto the king of Israel, <clears throat> Smite upon the ground, and he smote thrice, and stayed. you got to take those arrows. Open up real quick to Luke chapter 1, verse 20. And I want to show you that not believing in the King James Bible makes you dumb. It's basic, you know. Luke chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Don't be dumb. You know, there's, there's battles in your life that you need to smite to the ground. And, you know, I just pick on the easy ones because those are all the ones that got me. You know, it's the cigarettes, man. You know, and just every once in a while, you just want to, sm you need to smite that thing to the ground. Amen. You know, you don't just hit it once and twice and three times. You need to, you need to beat that thing into smithereens. Amen. 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 I don't know what your battle is. Mine was alcohol. You need to beat that thing into the ground, man. You need to beat that thing into the ground. Uh, you, you know, you, you think about, uh, what about depression? Oh, I'm sure you pastors and you students. Oh, you King James believers. Oh, you guys never get depressed. You're so tough. Hey, Amen. You're tougher than Elijah. You know, <laughs> you never, you never go to Juniper Junction like Peacock talked to. You never been there, huh? You need to beat that thing into the ground. Amen. That takes hard work, doesn't it? That takes hard work to be like, you know what? Why is that brother pray next to a toilet every time he preaches? Why? That's how you beat those things into the ground. You need to count your blessings, name them one by one. That takes work, doesn't it? Because you can't name them all. But the worst thing is you won't even try. I'm blessed, man. I'm blessed my dad came. My dad led me to the Lord. Amen. And it was from sin. He was the first person I ever saw get saved. I had arguments before. I was telling Brother Noah, I had arguments before. <laughs> but after I saw him get saved and the alcohol left our house, I remember specifically, I said, where's Mark and Mike? He said, I don't know. I said, I thought you guys were like, like tight. He said, well, I guess maybe since I stopped drinking, they don't really want to come over anymore. Wow. And I was like, I thought you guys were closer than that. He said, I did too. <laughs> it cost him something. And I couldn't, I couldn't quiet that in my spirit and my soul. But these things, you need to smite them to the ground. You know where a lot of people stop? You know, I, I teach this, and I don't know, whatever, you could probably correct me when I'm done. I teach that there's four spokes in the Christian wheel, if you want to grow. There's read your own Bible, pray your own prayers, go to a Bible-believing and preaching church, and tell somebody about it. You know where a lot of people stop? Bible, 
prayer, church, over. Yeah, that's yeah. Very true. One, two, three. They never want to tell anyone else about it. And I came under. I, I came here thinking that we were street preaching today, and I was like, "Man, that stirs me up." But you know what? On on your drive over here, you know, uh, you you could preach something on the drive over here. Put some hate speech on your van. Put some hate speech on your van, man. <laughs> Wear some hate speech. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, say something to the lady at the checkout booth, whatever. Just, there's something more that you can do. Because reading, praying, church, they all pour into you. It's all you, man. It's all you. Just, oh, all these folks pouring in. Oh, here, oh here's a bow. Here's some arrows. Oh, this is this how you do it? Oh, it's great. Oh, man, you really pull that back well. You know, but you never learn how to let go. You never learn how to let one fly. I'm going to end with this. The faithfulness, I'm sorry, faithlessness of the faithful you find in 2 Kings 13, 19. And the man of God, God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times, then hadst thou smitten Syria, till thou hadst consumed it, whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times, he says. Yeah, I just want to tell you this. Stopping short is a sin. Right. Stopping short is a sin. How dare you stop short? Good morning. And I'll, I'll, you think about, where do you stop short? You know where a lot of people stop short is Matthew 18, 15. Look at it. Look at it, Baptist. Look at it. Let's just, just open the Bible. We're Bible believers here. This is where a lot of people stop short, right here. King James, independent, fundamental, Bible believing, he, you know, hell hot, heaven sweet. This is you. Put this on. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Yeah. That is what's destroying your movement. You know, I, I was talking to a brother about it. He said, it, the body of Christ has an autoimmune deficiency. I was like, that's good. The problem is not from outside. The problem is in this room. It's right here. Because nobody, no Bible believer wants to do what the Bible says. Right there. Why? You never had to be forgiven? You, you never had to face anything hard? You're stopping at three. Yeah, I want to church, read, <laughs> pray. But I don't want to do it when it gets hard. Yep. That's good. Where do they stop? Redemption. They stop at telling other folks. They stop street preaching. That's right. You know, uh, I think uh, if it wasn't for Peter Ruckman, this thing would have never happened. Yeah. And Matt Crane got one of his last recordings. Yep. He's saying, go street preaching. Go street preaching. Anytime you can, whenever you can, however you can, get out there. Go street preaching. Go street preaching. Go street preaching. Go street preaching. <laughs> You can listen to the recording. He'll, he'll send it to you if you need it. Just give him your email address. He'll send it right to you. Where do you stop short? Your ministry, your family. You stop short there? That ministry God gave you. Don't stop short. I just want to encourage you with this. Our little church, uh, we've been faithfully going to the Antelope Valley Pagan Festival to street preach. And the first time I went, I think it was like one of the first times I ever street preached. And they put that thing on YouTube, and there's like over a million hits on it. And there's death threats and all this stuff. And it's a dragon lady. My wife can give you the address for that. I don't know. The dragon lady posted it. <laughs> but uh, we, we were, we were open-air preaching at their pagan festival. Then the next time, they, the following year, they opened up in the next town in Palmdale. And we found out where they were, and we street preached. <laughs> They're in Palmdale two years in a row. So that's one, Quartz Hill, Palmdale, Palmdale. The fourth year, I'm like, so where are they at this time? Mary Chris is looking for them. She's like, I don't see them. We, then we found it. They're way out in Leona Valley on some person's property. Our little church chased them out of town. Hey, man. 
Amen. You're like, oh, that's not, who got saved? I, hey, man, that was a victory. That's right. yes. You know, I, I took what some folks gave me, and I took those arrows, and maybe it wasn't the classiest. Maybe you would have done it different. Amen? But there was nobody there. I didn't trip over anybody. I just pulled those arrows, and I shot, and they're gone. Grace Fest, a local Christian rock show, that's where I came from. I came out of that stuff, okay? Uh, they threatened me with a lawsuit because I made a uh, track that said Grace Fest on it. It looked nothing like their logo. And actually, the A was some pentagramic, uh, what's that, New King James symbol? You know? <laughs> Satanic. <laughs> anyway, but that was the A. So technically, it didn't even say Grace Fest, okay? Now, all those things stand in court. Now it's unrecorded, too. So these are all just going to help me not get arrested. But... <laughs> Grace Fest, th they threatened me with a lawsuit. And now, when I came out to that one, um, you know, we just hand out these tracks exposing Grace Fest to every car that comes in. There's like a thousand cars. We're just handing them to whoever takes them. If you don't want one, that's fine. Hey, man, next car, we'll take it. And uh, anyway, the cop comes up to me and he says, You know what? You're a real pain in my. And I, he's wearing a Grace Fest shirt. And I said, Amen? <laughs> And his buddy looks at him and me, and <laughs> he starts laughing at this cop because he cursed at me. Anyway, I don't know what it was, but uh, I'll, clo I'll close with this. Is, uh, the next year, I, I changed the track because I'm not trying to be some idiot, okay? Yeah. We changed the track, okay? Uh, changed the track, and now I'm wearing like a little GoPro. That cop comes up, and he's like, hello, sir. Oh. I'm like, hi. He's like, we see you here every year. I'm like, oh, were you the cop here last year? He's like, yes, I was here last year. You're the cop that cursed at me. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. And anyway, I got treated completely different. <laughs> but the thing is, is because, you know, I've been going to Grace Fest. Uh, the church has been open seven years. We've been going somewhere in the ballpark of six years. They all, they all know me. And I wasn't about to stop. Amen. Now... I'll just leave you with this. Open your Bible, and I want seven minutes over. We'll just read one verse, and then I'll leave. Jeremiah. Don't show Peacock this, because I will be graded. <laughs> Prep and delivery was like my worst. Jeremiah, chapter 48. And this is my encouragement to you, preacher. This is my encouragement to you, Christian. This is my encouragement to you, young man. God possibly wants to do something with you. This is my encouragement to you. We're in Jeremiah 48 and verse 10. It said, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. And this is it. Cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. It's time to shoot. Pastor Jane. Don't hesitate to come if you want to. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I want to thank you so much for the preaching of your word and for your book. Lord, we let, we let compromising old age, politics, depression, our own flesh and bitterness and anger get the best of us and we've held back that bow. The Antichrist, isn't he the one that has the bow, Lord? Shouldn't we shoot? Shouldn't we shoot, Lord? Instead of like that man of sin declaring peace with that bow. Unfortunately, we live in a day and age, Lord, of Laodicea, where preachers have been all for proclaiming peace, peace, but your word said there is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. We have seen neo-evangelicals fall into this mess, and now we're seeing fundamental Baptist churches falling into it, and God forbid the Bible believers. Lord, help us to keep using the sword What's the point of being King James Bible believing if that's our only offensive weapon and we don't even use it, Lord? Saying it is one thing, but using it is another. 
Sure, you know, maybe we could have uh, we could have said it more smartly or more kindly or differently than Pastor Gorski, than Pastor Ryman, than Dr. Ruckman's abrasive language. But Heavenly Father, they did something, Lord. They shot. And that's better than a lot of preachers doing nothing, Lord. And we'd be surprised that with the different characters that you have used in different ministries, Lord, you have used so many people from the roughest to the kindest to the poorest, to the richest. All of them are part of the one body of Christ in unique ministry so that you can use them to glorify your name, Lord. And now we lived in a day and age of preachers that we all run to a machine and, oh, I got to follow like this preacher, so and so. And it turns into a machine rather than how the Holy Spirit guides through that individual, making them the unique preacher that you want them to be and to shoot that arrow, Lord. I pray, Heavenly Father, that today's preaching has convicted and changed our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that He can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what He did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, Pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure. You could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that He died buried and resurrected so that His blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through His blood to save you then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.